Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. This morning, my guest is Robert Costanza. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I thank you so much. You're 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 joining in from London. Yes, I am. I, yeah. Yes, you are. So thank you for being on my show. Let me let me tell my viewers just a little bit about you because there is so much, but let me share with my viewers. Robert Costanza is professor of ecological economics at the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College, London. He is a fellow in the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and the Royal Society of Arts in the UK. He is an overseas expert in the Chinese Academy of Science and currently a senior fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Center in Stockholm, Sweden an affiliate fellow at the Gund Institute at the University of Vermont, and a Datao Master of Ecological Economics at the Datao Masters Academy in Shanghai, China, and is an honorary professor at Australian National University. Does that sound about right? <laughs> yeah, that's enough. <laughs> it's a small, small piece of who you are and what you've done. And I got, I, in my research of you, Bob, I just got exhausted. So um, <laughs> I don't know how you do all you do, but the list goes on and on about all your accomplishments. I could say the same about you. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to start um, with my viewers to understand that you, you, it is written that you are a global pioneer of transdisciplinary research mm. at the complex intersection of dynamic human economic and social systems and stressed ecosystems that is informing new models of and pathways to sustainable prosperity. Now, in layman's terms, can you explain to my viewers your life's journey through your mm -hmm. work and what it is you hope to change in the human dynamic to save our species? Yeah. Okay, I'll try. Um, maybe I'll go back to my, <laughs> my PhD work, which was in systems ecology. Um, I studied with H.T. Uh, Odom at the University of Florida. And so the idea, the idea there was to look at the whole system, um, not just the pieces, but how all the pieces you know, fit together and how they behave you know, over time. What's the dynamic interactions among, among all of those systems? I, I think we don't, we don't spend enough time thinking in that way about our complex world. Um, and that, <clears throat> that led to you know, trying to incorporate economics and how the economic system functions, you know, into the into the whole picture. So it's not just the market; um, it's really the economy embedded within society, embedded within the rest of nature, and and understanding that it's the rest of nature. We're part of nature as well. It's not humans and nature. It's it's us and and all the the other parts of the system. So I think that's a you know a needed perspective. Uh, if we're really going to uh, create a sustainable and desirable future, which I think is what we're we're all trying to do, we want to create a better world where where um, you know we can provide well-being, sustainable well-being for for at least the majority, if not all, of the the people on the planet. Um, <clears throat> so to do that, we have to understand how that system works, and we also have to understand how to how to transform you know from where we are into into this um, into this better world. So that's been my my quest, I guess, over over that time. And as you know, I spent I spent uh, eight years there at the University of Vermont, and we started the um, the Gund Institute um, there back in two thousand and two uh, as a as a way to pursue that that uh, that broader agenda. And the whole field of ecological economics is really about about that. You know, how do we how do we understand the whole system? It's a transdisciplinary approach, and I don't think we'll will really be able to solve these problems from the perspective of any one academic discipline, because those are, are usually too narrow in their, their perspectives. They're not putting the whole system together. And I think there's been, yeah. Go it's ahead. all interconnected, right? Yeah, it's all connected. That is the, the basic principle of, of economics. Uh, but <clears throat> um, it, I think it needs to be taken much more seriously, particularly now in the, in the Anthropocene epic, you know, that we're currently in, where we know that our impacts on our ecological life support system and our impacts on our, our social life support system are also being being threatened you know so we're we're, we're facing uh, many crises uh, going forward and we we are approaching several tipping points both on the biophysical side uh, but also hopefully on the on the social side you know if we really want to solve these problems i think we have to really make the kind of transformational changes uh, that that are needed 
Well, we're going to get into that in my interview because I, unfortunately, I may not be as optimistic <laughs> as you are. Now, we both are the same age. We were born in the same year. We were actually born in the same state. Um, but that's about all we have in common. But we did work together a little bit at the Gund Institute, and I'll get into that in a little later on yeah. the local uh, economy. Now, you have co-authored over 600 scientific papers and 28 books, and your work has been cited more than 130,000 times in Google Scholar. You've been interviewed more than 350 times, and here I am, your 351st, <laughs> of which I'm very, very honored to to have the opportunity to spend some time with you bob now i want to focus on who you are i mean mm. what what who is bob costanza and what brought you to your extraordinary life's work bringing together the power of economics to support the future of our species talk to us a little bit about that and share a little bit about your childhood okay well i i was born in a, a little town i was born in pittsburgh actually pennsylvania at Allegheny General Hospital, but um, the town I spent my first uh, seven years in was um, was kind of an infamous little town in Pennsylvania called Denora, Pennsylvania. And uh, two years before I was born, they had this smog incident where there was a temperature inversion in this, uh, you know, a little river valley uh, steel mill town. And uh, <clears throat> they had a temperature inversion that lasted for a week and the steel mill just kept pumping stuff you know out into the valley and filled it up with smog and uh, <clears throat> that smog incident caused um, <clears throat> 20 uh, 20 immediate deaths and uh, several uh, several deaths afterwards my mother had a miscarriage as a re as a result of that that incident and uh, <clears throat> I think it yeah it uh, it was one of the first sort of fatal air pollution inc incidents uh, uh, in the world and that was followed by Similar incidents in uh, in London in 1952 and in, in L.A. the famous L.A. smog and I think all of those together um, led to eventually the Clean Air Act and the creation of EPA and and etc. and the you know the environmental movement. But it it was the the recognition that you know this this sort of rapid progress and focus on uh, industrial production and and growth had some significant side effects, negative side effects. Uh, that needed to be addressed if we really wanted to to you know, create a better world. So um, another result of that incident was they closed down the steel mill eventually, and uh, my father uh, and family, and we all moved to South Florida, where the air was cleaner, uh, and I grew up mainly in uh, in South Florida, and went eventually went to uh, went to school at the University of Florida. Right. Yeah. Well, I was raised right next to the Bethlehem steel mills. Ah, okay. So we and, even more in common. <laughs> yeah. And I have, I, I carry that, you know, in my lungs. I mean, it's there when you're raised. Um, yeah. And, and I, Did you ever read uh, Deborah Davis's book, When Smoke Ran Like Water? I have not. So, but yeah, I will should take, take a look at that one. It really, it's a, it's a good uh, history of the Denora incident and, and some of the other ones I was talking about and, and, uh, and the repercussions of that. And there are a lot of people in this country who would like to return to those days, who would like to get rid of all the regulations and go back to where we're all breathing really stinky air and and killing ourselves. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and, go ahead. No, go ahead. Next question. Um, well, your childhood is really important, and that's in, that's that's now I, I'm not so sure how clean Florida is how. Was, I think coming to Vermont was probably a, a good thing for you to do because Vermont's air still is pretty pure, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, I I really loved my time my time in Vermont. It's a, a beautiful you. a beautiful state. Yeah, and we do miss yeah. you, um, especially that, especially those long winters, you know, with with snow up to the. <laughs> well, I love that. I just I just <laughs> I'm a big winter person, but anyway. Yeah. And back in the days in Pennsylvania, I remember six foot snowstorms or five foot snowstorms that we used to have back in the day when oh, yeah. we don't have those anymore. So at what point in your life, Bob, did you realize that the power of the purse had the ability to wake up humans to save their planet? I mean, that connection between the economy and the planet and humans well-being. Well, again, I'll go back to my my PhD days, uh, because I think that that opened my eyes to how these things were all connected, and um, and you and you, you know that uh, that economics does 
um, control a lot of the decision making that goes on at, at many different scales. Um, my PhD re research had to do with land use changes and land use planning and uh, what happened to uh, South Florida, you know, historically over time and how that whole sort of development pattern was was going on and what was driving it, you know, and, and obviously was not driving it in a direction that that maximized the quality of life where the where the population is driving it in a direction that maximized, you know, the the uh, uh, the profits of the of developers and and uh, and, and other <clears throat> feedbacks like that. So, you know, if you want to change those those kinds of uh, systems, you have to understand, you know, how how they work and where the leverage points are. And uh, that was what I've been trying to do since since then. That's been your life's uh, work. Yeah. So, so you're you're an intellectual and um, and in many ways a researcher and 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 a scientist, but politically, if we can't change our world politically, mm. that makes things a lot harder, wouldn't you say? To be well, I think I think like like I was getting at, it's all part of this larger system, and and how we govern ourselves uh, is a is a huge you know controlling factor. So how do we make how do we make uh, decisions you know as uh, as groups at multiple scales you know from from families to companies to to countries you know to the uh, to the whole planet so the process of decision making um, I think is a is a key part of it and, and governance governance in general you know and I think I think democracy is a great idea and we ought to try it um, so how do we actually get a, a truly democratic uh, governance system, because I think currently in the United States and, and many other countries that call themselves democracies, they're not really democracies. I mean, they're plutocracies and, and various versions that are controlled by by special interests, not by the not by the uh, not by the will of the of the people. And I think that as part of that process, um, that that there's an effort to to divide and conquer rather than to than to build a shared vision. And I think that's what we're that's what we're seeing. So <clears throat> how do we build, you know, a strong and a true democracy? Uh, Vermont, I, I think, has some interesting examples. You know, the Vermont town meeting as a, as a sort of direct, direct democracy kind of, kind of thing uh, is, one, <clears throat> is one example that we could, we could potentially build on. But, but I think that, yeah, we, we need to do something quite, quite different and more innovative with our, with our governance institutions. And I think people are beginning to realize that, that, that the current... The current system is really not working; uh, is not leading to to a better life for, for most people, and that <clears throat> is a huge problem. But it's also an opportunity. Uh, you know that that uh, you need those sort of crises in order to 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 make the kinds of changes that I think we're we're after. Um, the latest book I published is uh, is titled "Addicted to Growth." Um, what's the societal therapy that we need to overcome these problems? And framing our problem as an addiction, I think, is is useful because it it makes you realize that simply simply understanding the problem and simply understanding the solutions is often not enough, you know, to make any significant behavioral change. We've known about these problems for for decades, and we've also known about the solutions for decades, but we haven't really made progress because we've been, you know, framing those solutions in in a more of a confrontational way, in, in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, lead to behavior change. So uh, I think that's that's our challenge. How do we how do we really understand that process well enough uh, to begin to, uh, to to build the therapy that we need to overcome these the lock in, you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the addiction that we're that we're stuck in. Well, it also comes down to inequality because the people who are who are on the, the bottom rung of our of our economic uh, well-being don't have the ability to think about things the way that other people do. And even with the town hall meetings in Vermont, if you have a an hourly job and you can't take a Tuesday off to go to town meeting, your vote isn't counted. Yeah. So no, I think is a, is a, anyway, go ahead on that. No, one. no, that's, that's a huge issue. And I think that's, that's something that really reduces our, our societal well being. You know, the fact that we're, we're destroying our social capital by having such huge gaps in in, uh, in income uh, income inequality. 
and I think that's that's part of what has to um, that has to change, and it and it certainly can change. I mean, you know, since at the end of World War II until 1980 or so, we were reducing income inequality in the U.S. and in most other countries. You know, we were we had you know progressive taxation. We had we had a we were building a uh, the welfare state, uh, and it was only after the the sort of Reagan Thatcher neoliberal. Uh, uh, changes <clears throat> that that started going back in the opposite direction, and uh, so it, it 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 leads it it means that we do know we do know how to solve the problems, uh, but <clears throat> it's going to take it's going to take a different um, political you know agenda, and I think that's got to be forced you know uh, by a by a large um, civil society movement, well, and... mov movement of movements. I mean, it's not it's going to take. The coming together of many of the of the movements that are that are out there today for climate justice and social justice and and etc. You know we're all I think um, heading in the right in the same direction, but we're not really coordinated. There's a group I'm involved with called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance that's trying to do just that. How do you bring all of these movements together? And I think until we can get that critical mass and and have it actually uh, begin to affect. The decision making on the system, then, uh, yeah, I don't think we'll be making much progress. Um, and time's running out. Um, so, can you talk to my viewers a bit about some of the solutions that you have uncovered, whereby the way that we look at our work and our economic well being can and must consider the planet? Yeah. Well, I think one of the key things is to first recognize uh, that we have to change our fundamental goals for. Um, for economies, for societies. I mean, part of the part of the problem is that that uh, conventional uh, economics and and politics, you know, is focused on GDP growth as being the solution to to all problems. You know, and if economies stop growing in GDP terms, then you know it's a disaster. And in fact, we know that that's that's not the case. Uh, that in fact, um, GDP growth has some very negative side effects that we've been able to. To uh, document and measure and and, uh, and compare with with GDP, and we haven't been making genuine progress when you look at the the impacts of um, growing income inequality and growing environmental damage. You know that that sort of cancels out uh, all of the growth in in GDP income, and GDP growth has only gone to a very small fraction of the population, the top one or even the top 0.1 percent of the population. So you know. Making that that clear that we're it's not GDP growth that we need it's really improvement in societal well-being and what does that involve it means you know uh, a more equitable distribution of wealth and income uh, it means uh, you know a societal floor you know universal basic services or universal basic income so that no one should be left behind it means you know staying within planetary boundaries you know uh, dealing with climate change climate change is one of our our major planetary boundaries that were exceeding, but also biodiversity loss and nitrogen cycling. So there's a, you know, a list of these, but recognizing that we live on a, on a finite planet and that we have to have to uh, understand those, those limitations, but also understand how to, how to, how to produce uh, well-being uh, for, for everyone. And um, <clears throat> yeah. So are, we, so, so are you seeing it around the, around the world? Cause you are a worldly, a uh, man who who certainly uh, understands other countries, that the socialist societies are the ones that are caring for um, humanity. I mean, even if you just go across the border from Vermont into Canada, it's very different yeah. in the way that they yeah. take care of. And in, and in this country, you have lines and lines and miles and miles. In San Francisco, miles and miles of homeless um, mm. And people who 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 are being ignored and and let go by our society, so the, the whole concept of a of a socialist political um, framework. Well, like, certainly Scandinavia, yeah, and, and right. countries that that uh, that that take these ideas much more seriously are doing, I think, a lot a lot better. Uh, not that they couldn't also be improved. Um, and what you want to call it, um, you know, I. If you want to call it socialism, I'm I'm happy with that term. But I but, love that uh, term. I do. <laughs> you I mean, call it something. You call it, um, yeah. But, but I think. But, but what you're saying, Bob, is that 
when we lift society up, the planet he the planet has a time to heal. When people yeah. are struggling and they're suffering, they can't think about the things that we need to think about in order to save our species. When she's right. yeah, yeah, so, and well, we need to take uh, society and we need to take the rest of nature into account. So I think it could be you know eco ecoism as well, or whole systemism. Um, I like this. I actually like the Swedish term lagom, which means just enough that everybody, everybody should have just enough, not too much, not too little. And if you had that philosophy uh, for life, I think we'd, we'd all be much better off as they are, as they are in Scandinavia in general. So, so, what, so where, where would you, if, to, to be perfectly honest, where do you see us as a species in the direction that we're going? <laughs> well, I think we're at a critical juncture, you know, I mean, I think his, historically civilizations uh, collapse and have collapsed. And uh, <clears throat> so I think there's, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly a, a, a good likelihood that, that this civilization can, can follow along unless we can, uh, we can do something differently. And I think we have certainly have the tools now to be able to see the future much, much better than these historical societies have been able to. And we can also see the, you know, the possibilities um, much better than historical societies had been able to. So whether we can use that information uh, in in new ways to prevent the collapse and to make a, a smoother transition into a, a steady state, you know, sort of uh, sustainable <clears throat> and desirable future, I think that's the that's the challenge, and I think that's what we we have to work toward. Do you feel that and the I, younger do you feel that the younger are hope? Because our generation, I mean, you, I'm the '60s generation, civil rights. Uh, you know, human rights, women's rights, disability rights, racial rights. We were all about that. Earth Day was our generation, but we failed. We failed, um, you know, other generations that have come after us. And and I feel like some of the future, the hope for the future for humanity is embedded in our youth. Um, would you agree with that? Well, certainly, as it always has been. Um, but and I think it's not it's not a uh, not pitting one generation against others, uh, but I think I think we all need to work toward um, toward a better future. Um, you know, us us oldsters to leave a better legacy, but it's for who for the for the younger generation. So, do you I believe we've in, done I think that? it's in all of our interests. Uh, sorry, do you believe we've done that? Um, not very effective. No, we no. haven't. I, I feel like we. <laughs> so I, so I wanted to. But that's not. But that's not a reason to give up. No. Uh, or or to or to harp on you know the the uh, the remaining problems. I think the I think the issue is how do you how do you make progress and how do you how do we um, overcome the barriers that we're that we're still facing. Right. So it's you know it's it's easy to get um, <clears throat> it's easy to give up. But well, I, 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 I will never give up, but I personally, um, when I'm doing lectures, I always somewhat apologize for the fact that, that we try, we did try and somehow, somehow we didn't do enough. And here we are, uh, where we are today as a species. So why are humans hmm. so reluctant to move in directions that are in their best interest and in the best interest for the children's children? It really does come down to economics, and so often it's the money that stands in the way of progress. Talk to us about that. Well, I think it's more the uh, the addiction that stands in the way of progress, and money is a money is a vehicle, you know, for uh, for for motivating that. It's you know, it's we end up in these um, these social traps, as they're called. Uh, and situations where we feel like we've invested so much in the current the current system that we can't that we can't change. Uh, so there's some really interesting games we could talk about that that show how that how that functions and how psychologically uh, we tend to we tend to uh, <clears throat> you know put too much emphasis on trying to preserve what we have as opposed to um, change things for the change things for the better. So I think it's a a psychological issue with the way uh, humans behave, um, but I think um, I think it's also something that that uh, that can be overcome uh, with the right therapy. So, so who provides <laughs> that therapy? Well, I think it's it's a societal problem, and I think the therapy has to come from at least parts of of society. Um, and I think 
for the situation we're in now, it's going to take, like I said, a movement of movements. It's going to take, you know, not just um, the younger generation, but the but the whole population uh, that that recognizes that we can't go on the way we are. But what's the missing element now? I think is um, a clear shared vision of the kind of world that we're trying to create. You know, people don't don't have that shared vision. They don't see what's possible. And I think that's what we that's what one thing I've been trying to to produce. How do you how do you convey that we could have a, a much better world where um, you know inequality was much lower, where we're dealing with climate change, we're solving all these problems, we've achieved all of the SDGs, and everyone's going to be better off. You're not going to be worse off than they are now because I think the the conventional mindset is oh you know if we we do all these environmental things. Everybody's income is going to go down, and we'll all be better. We'll all be worse off. Well, I think that's the opposite of what what the case would be. Well, uh, I also for the, for the majority of people, and even and even for the for rich people, you know, chasing their peers and 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 trying to keep up with you know the other billionaires does not make does not make people particularly happy. So if you really <laughs> If you really want, if you really want to improve people's life satisfaction and well-being, um, we need a whole different kind of, of uh, social and economic system, and one that can actually help uh, preserve the planet as well. Um, but we do have humans on the planet who do control most of the power and the wealth, and they continue to, to, um, I mean, not all of them, but to. Uh, basically destroy the planet for their own gain and in a world well, that's, well that's and part, it, yeah. and that's part of the that's part of the addiction you know it's that the it's a narrow subset that's being positively reinforced by the current system and doesn't want that system to change even if it does lead to the long-term destruction of the system so yeah those are the, those are the forces that we need to deal with yeah. we have to deal with it in a world where democracy is being attacked and especially in this country mm -hmm. I mean, thank heavens for the Supreme Court's decision yesterday. Um, but it, it, our democracy is being attacked, and fascism is taking hold. Um, and uh, how do we create anything like a shared vision uh, when those who have the wealth want to keep control of humanity's future? I mean, it's it has to come down to the people rising up, yeah, and and making that change. And unfortunately, uh, well, or fortunately. Um, humans will do that right do you do you they believe will and they will? have and the, they have in the past um <laughs> risen up and, and challenged and challenged the regimes that that were suppressing them uh so we've seen historically you know both sides of both sides of the story both of both uh, civilizations collapse but also but also we've seen you know radical transformations happen in relatively short periods of time so it's not like it's impossible and I think we are, you know, at a in a period when there are so many, you know, converging crises, that, and, and, you know, in a sense, it opens an opportunity. It opens the door for, for, um, you know, significant changes like we're talking about. And in fact, you could argue that, you know, you don't you don't really have a chance to make those changes until some, some, um, some major crises, you know, have have made it a possibility. So, you know, if the smoke in New York City and and Vermont remains in the air for uh, for long enough, and we begin to see, you know, the, the implications of the loss of our democratic institutions. Um, <clears throat> I think it uh, things can turn around and re and relatively quickly. So, relatively so, quickly, I'm hearing that from the from the mind of Bob Costanza. That that relatively. So, so your hope. <laughs> so your hope for the future. So tell me, um, your hope for the future of our species. Give me. Give us something positive to 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 think about as we're joking on, <laughs> joking on the air. Yeah, from, from your brilliant mind, what hope do you well, have for the species? No, I think it's I think there is a positive vision that's that's possible. I didn't I didn't say it's you know inevitable. Uh, it certainly is is equally likely, if not more likely, that you know, the collapse scenario would happen. But I think it's our challenge, it's our it's our opportunity uh, to go in the other direction, and to say, you know, let's let's create this this better world for ourselves, for our children, etc. And I think getting that message out, getting that hopeful message out, um, can motivate 
you know, a, not, a large enough fraction of the population to really make these changes happen. Um, how do we get that message out? That's a, that I leave to you, Melinda. Well, I'm leaving it to you because I, as your book, Addicted to Growth, Society, Therapy for a Sustainable Well-Being Future. And this is your book that you just released. Yes. Yeah. And it's available in local bookstores. And so I okay. want to encourage my viewers to pick up a copy of Robert Costanza's new book. Um, you, This is your life's work. You've been doing this since I met you back when we were trying to put together a local, our local Currency. currency yeah. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. That Burlington, was so... Burlington bread. Burlington <laughs> bread, man. I mean, I still have a few in my drawer. Yeah, and me what, too. what a what a novel. <laughs> and it ended up morphing into a VBS project of the barter system, mm -hmm. where they created this, you know, local and, and all these businesses now through VBS are basically bartering their services and stuff. So it okay. it, so it, it did. did create some really good stuff. And Vermont, I think Vermont's kind of leading the way on a lot of this stuff, would you say? Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. We I are. So yeah. what, what is your next project? Do you have anything that you're working on or you're just taking your book around and um, se reading? several things? I was um, I was actually at a at a conference at the European Parliament several weeks ago on Beyond Growth. So they are actually talking about this, you know, and the European Parliament and the you know, president of the commission was there and gave it gave it a nice speech about the limits to growth and, and how we need to move beyond beyond GDP. Is it so I, I think there is some some progress being made. Um, I think we need um, several things. One is an alternative to GDP, you know, that we can use to monitor and, and measure our progress toward toward this this better system. And um, actually, we did a class last term. Where we had the students go and look for all of the alternatives to GDP that have been proposed, and they found 350 so far. <laughs> so it's not like people haven't been thinking about this, you know, for for a while and more and more intensively. Uh, but in fact, that's that's part of the problem. There are so many different alternatives that nobody knows, you know, which which ones to use. So I think the next stage is to uh, to try to build a broader consensus about what. What the the alternative you know measures of progress uh, should be, um, you know we worked a bit on the genuine progress indicator in Vermont. As far as I I know, is still uh, using the the GPI, and I'm not sure what kind of political influence it it has, if any, uh, but uh, partly because probably it's not as broadly shared and and uh, uh, you know endorsed um, as as GDP is. But I think that's uh, that that's coming. So. There's several projects underway to to try to build that that consensus, and uh, at least the EU is is uh, is partly behind that movement. There's also the Wellbeing Economy Governments Group. Uh, so there's a small subset of of you know vanguard governments, including Scotland, Iceland, New Zealand, uh, Finland, and Canada. Actually, I just joined in Wales, and uh, <clears throat> you know their their agenda is well-being rather than GDP growth. You know, so is the United begin, States part of that? Uh, not yet, no. Well, why not? <laughs> Maybe Vermont, yeah, no, we've been trying to, to potentially get um, at least some states in the U.S. Uh, to be part of that. Uh, but Is you know, Vermont? Is Vermont, Vermont? Vermont would be a great one to join. Uh, so if you're well, interested, in, if you're interested in, in helping to push that agenda, I can, uh, I'll put people in contact with you. Thank and you. Maybe you can, I yeah, will push it. Make, I'll make, make it first, happen. Yeah. So that would be good, you know, a well-being economy government in in Vermont. You know, New Zealand has gotten a lot of traction on that and created the first, you know, well-being um, budget for their uh, for that for the country. Um, take a look at um, Nicola Sturgeon, the first first minister of Scotland, has a, has a really good TED talk about this uh, that they should uh, I recommend uh, people taking a look at. Um, but uh, of course, like any of these these things, I mean, she recently stepped down as first minister. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, I think, is has stepped down as, as uh, prime minister of New Zealand. I think she's going to be a professor at Harvard, actually. I think you now, uh, but but um, I think those kinds of movements um, can and will begin to happen more. You know, we have more more governments uh, saying no. We understand that you have to get beyond. Beyond GDP, we understand the, the issues and the crises that are building up. You know, I think they can't they can't avoid them any longer. 
Uh, and so there's got to be some some radical changes. And uh, so keep the faith. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for your time. You are my hero. And um, I really appreciate all the work you've done in your career to move the needle and um, helping to save Thanks. our planet. And to my viewers, um, thank you for joining us. And um, I encourage you to, to pick up uh, Robert Costanza's new book, Addicted to Growth, Societal Therapy for a Sustainable Well-Being Future. And you can get it, I hope it's at the local bookstore up there at Phoenix Books. I'm sure it is. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. So, um, and Bob, I'll get you back on again and we'll follow okay. up with this in a few years and see how well we've done. And until then, I wish you well. Um, and when you get back to Vermont, check in with me and, and I'd love to lead a movement to get Vermont to sign on um, to this, uh, this organization that's helping to move the needle. So thank okay. you for that. And to my viewers, you have a beautiful day and I will see you shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. Bye now.